Good morning. I want to welcome you to church this morning. I'm going to get started. Um, while I'm highlighting a few announcements as usual, uh, let us know how we can pray for you, how we can encourage you. Um, there's a perforated part of the bulletin. Uh, you could share prayer requests or a praise off is always helpful and encouraging to, to read. And, and so you'd fill that out. There's a purple offering box in the back there that you would um, uh, put the, um, the prayer request in. There are a couple of announcements I want to bring your attention to. One is not in the bulletin. Um, and so I've had a few of you kind of look kind of strangely at me, uh, more strange than normal, um, wondering why I'm wearing a t-shirt this morning. So this is my uh, Faith Over Fear t-shirt, and it has Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 on the bottom here. Um, my son and one of his friends had started an apparel company. It's an online apparel company. And we're going to have a link on to our church website that you can go and get um, uh, shirts like this. And we're going to have shirts, mugs, and fun stuff that with the church's logo on it. Everything purchased, uh, the church will get 10% back. It's not a big money maker or anything like that, but it's a, a conversation starter for your faith. Um, the company's name is J-Swag, which stands for uh, Just Someone Who Admires God. And so I'll show you a couple of their other designs. So this one here, by the way, I'm giving this one away this morning because I ordered too small of a size. <laughs> Can anyone guess what this, what scripture this might refer to? Was that when the kids mocked uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a real good guess. But, but you, you have a bear here, and he has a, a bunch of grapes in his mouth. It says, bear fruit. Um, and, and the reference is to John 15, 8. Can anyone uh, use a size, it's a size large, it's a little small. Anyone in here like it? <laughs> so, that's a good catch. That one's mine. So, um, there'll be a link providing some news on the bulletin in the next few weeks. You'll see it, and if you just want to go there, uh, when you visit our church website, you'll you'll uh, be able to access the link and, and that type of thing. But more to come on that. I um, want to thank you for your supplies that you've been getting for the uh, um, block party. Um, Crayons, notebooks can be put back there on the table. We, we're almost very close to our goal, and we'll see today we might have gone over it. I'm not real sure. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot, but I know there's a, a lot of you have asked, and some of you may be wondering, but uh, some of you know my mom had a stroke this past Monday, and so um, I went down to uh, my hometown to visit her. Uh, she's doing better. She's... Uh, recovering um, and she's trying to bear with my my brothers and their their new instructions on what her life is going to look like now <laughs> and she she's so prayer for my brothers maybe more even for my mom I don't know but pray pray for my mom as she continues to recover and um, more about that perhaps a little bit later but is there anything I'm missing before we continue I want you to pray with me first before we go to worship. Lord, we, we're grateful to be here. Lord, you know your people, everyone who is here this morning, and you know those who are still searching, wondering whether they want to call you their God or not. I pray that you will show them that you are a good God, that you are uh, compassionate, and that you want to know them. And Lord, for all of us who have minds and hearts that are scattered all over the place, which is probably all of us to some degree, uh, we're asking for your spirit 
uh, to calm us, to instruct us, and to point us to Jesus. Uh, we need him more than we'll ever know, and we pray in his name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm, I'm already halfway through the first song. I was singing it while I was walking up, so you, you guys are late. You didn't, you didn't join in. Um, a formal welcome to you again. Uh, one of our songs that we're going to sing, I think it's our third song, I guess, is uh, Created Me a Clean Heart. So, of course, that's uh, taken from Psalm 51. So that was on my mind this morning. And as pastor just prayed about, you know, oftentimes we, we all come to church with different cares, concerns, thoughts, struggles. Uh, we can be in multiple places, right? Um, but we hit these doors and, and we're hoping we look forward to entering into worship where the Lord is. And somehow when we do that, it becomes an enjoyable thing to him and a meaningful thing to us to do that together. But just as a way maybe of setting our minds, I just thought I might read a, a few verses from Psalm 51. Of course, this is called a contrite sinner's prayer for pardon. This is a Psalm of uh, David after he was confronted uh, by Nathan after he uh, sinned with Bathsheba. So that kind of sets the context. But I'm just going to read uh, verse, start in verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen? Amen. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. So a word from the Lord, Psalm 51 this morning. We're going to invite you to stand with us and sing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
you, Lord. Be unto your name. created me a clean heart. Oh 
Well, this is our uh, normal pastoral prayer time uh, following singing, but we have a special item of prayer this morning, so we're going to invite Pastor Bob to come on up. Uh, most of you are aware, but maybe for those of you who aren't aware or maybe need a reminder, Pastor Bob is ready to uh, embark on a journey. He is uh, going on a three-month sabbatical starting August 1st, which is what? That's next Sunday. Oh, you're not going to be here next Sunday? Well, we got a week to figure out what's going to happen next Sunday. Um, anyway, we want to invite Pastor Bob up, of course. Um, we're thankful as a church to be able to grant him this time of uh, rest, uh, seeking the Lord, enjoying the Lord, um, preparing for the time after sabbatical. I'll let you share what all you <laughs> maybe plan to do on sabbatical. Uh, but in any event, it's a gift uh, that we're happy to give Pastor Bob, and we want to send him out the right way, so to speak, um, by asking the Lord to take care of him and, and guide his steps. So I'm going to invite the elders to come forward as we pray for Pastor Bob. But we also want this to be, we, you know, Pastor Bob is your pastor as well. So we want all of you to have an opportunity to pray for him, to join in that prayer. Uh, if you would like, uh, you can pray from where you are. You can come forward and touch him if you want and say a prayer over him. Uh, that is all okay. So I'm going to let Brother Paul lead us in our prayer time. Father, we, we thank you so much for Pastor Bob. We thank you for his gifts and talents and abilities and experiences. We thank you for all the many, many, many years that he has served here faithfully and loyally to you. And we thank you so much for his leadership and his vision and how, how he has helped this church grow. We pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to be upon him as he embarks on his journey of, of being away for a while. We ask, Father, that you would give him wisdom and guidance as he balances his life and, and, and just being alone and being with family and uh, getting physical rest, spiritual rest, emotional rest, and um, uh, just rest in you. Um, we pray, Father, that your, again, your Holy Spirit would be upon him and give him a vision of where our church is to go in the next coming months and years ahead. And I pray that this would just be a very fruitful time for him, uh, just growing closer to you and growing more intimate with you and growing to love you even more and more each day and growing to love Sue and his family more and more and loving his extended extended family and growing closer to his extended family. So, Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would be with him in Jesus' name.
to his mom, and I don't think it was a stroke, but they are thankful that he had a time when they uh, probably would spend a time with her that he knew without worrying about, okay, what's happening with the church in Grand Rapids. So he knows that that he's being taken care of, uh, and that he can relax and be fully focused on on, on her and on whatever else he uh, he has planned for her. So well deserved to uh, to have her. Mm-hmm. Well, Lord, we know that even while you were here on earth, there were times when you uh, departed from the people and and the crowds and time to get alone and and spend in prayer and and rest and we know lord that that's important to us and being a pastor can be a wonderful blessing but it can be a a real burden at times too and stressful and this past year has been uh, particularly stressful and lots of changes with uh, all the covid stuff and um and losing a pastor a, a helper here and uh been a lot of things going on, and we pray that this would just be a time of refreshing for our pastor, and uh, a time of drawing closer to you, and a time of um, enjoying your creation, and enjoying his family, and and um, we ask you, Lord, to be with, with Sue, too. We It can be difficult being a pastor's wife sometime, and, and feel kind of alone and isolated, and um, we just pray that it would be a special time for her also and, mm-hmm. and time with Jared and the rest of the family. And we pray that you would just um, just refresh them all. Mm-hmm. Well, Father, we thank you so much that you're here with us today. And Lord, you said that you made the Sabbath for man and not man for the Sabbath. So I pray that this sabbatical will be a Sabbath of rest and renewal for pastor. And that, Lord, we all realize that he is our pastor, and we thank you so much for the gift that he is. But we also know that you are Lord. Mm -hmm. So this church will continue to worship you during this time when Pastor is is resting and renewing. And so we thank you that you're here with us, and we thank you for our pastor. And we ask that you'll give him wonderful rest. Stand up, thank God for Bible Stone for our church, and we uh, ask the Lord to bless and protect uh, both him and his family during this uh, next few months. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the under shepherd that you have given to us and Pastor Bob. Um, he's been a faithful friend. Uh, he's been a, a faithful servant of yours here, day in and day out, uh, year after year, and he's been a he's been a model in so many ways, Lord, um, of someone who is willing to walk out what it means to have a a broken and, and contrite spirit before you. He's not a he's not a prideful man, um, and. And Lord, I thank you for that. He's he's a humble servant who seeks to find you, to really um, just search you out, expresses his need to you, and you answer. And it may not always be apparent to him that you're with him, but it's apparent to me, and it's apparent to us. And I thank you for the very humble and yet powerful way that he approaches the scriptures and and just brings forth your word week by week in a very straightforward um, and spirit-filled way and lets your word dictate and guide. And uh, so I just pray that you'd be good to him during this sabbatical. Uh, I pray that you would keep him. I pray that just like we sang, you would not take your Holy Spirit from him, but just continue to pour it out more and more and more. And I pray that he would uh, just find exceptional joy in your presence.
And so we, we just give, give him to you now, Lord. I ask that you take him, take good care of him and his family. And uh, we pray for all the other needs, unspoken needs that we haven't got to this morning, Lord, but they're no less important to us or to you. So we pray that you would, um, we just lift up all the unspoken needs, the groanings of your Holy Spirit, um, that your Holy Spirit is interpreting on our behalf. And we pray for all those things as well. In Jesus' name, amen. But this is Caleb's, I don't know if this is your last Sunday with us or not, but but you are moving, right? I am. Okay. Right now, yeah. Do you want to tell us anything about that or try to? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> you guys want to change his mind in any way, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, like over the past year, uh, I've been kind of inspired by my friends and, you know, relatives to just try new things and move on. And, you know, I wasn't really too happy with the way that things were going in my life before the pandemic. And so... I just want to take this chance in my life while I'm still young to just take a leap and hopefully grow uh, just as a man in my faith and in life as, as well. So that's that's my ideal. That's what I want to go for. So. And, and, yeah. <laughs> so Caleb, as many of you know, has been one of our worship leaders the last several months and uh, maybe even years. I don't know. At least been a couple of years. A couple of years. So. Uh, very grateful for your your service, uh, your humility of uh, serving Christ in ways that we've uh, needed and, and uh, benefited from, and so we're going to miss you, and just want to pray for you real quick, and you guys make sure before he leaves uh, to try to persuade him to stay in Michigan, <laughs> but no, seriously, just let him know you're praying for him and you appreciate him. Father, uh, we're grateful for Caleb. I uh, pray that uh, it will be very apparent when he gets out in Colorado that you've been there before him, of course, uh, waiting for him or wanting to show him things that uh, will encourage him that, that you're in charge of his life and you care for him. Thank you for as many years of, of uh, serving us. And I just pray that you'll find him a good community of believers out there that can walk with him and, and be friends with him. Uh, Lord, we commit Caleb to you. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thanks. That's what you're saying about the AC. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're in Isaiah chapter 30 this morning. Isaiah chapter 30, it's, as you know, some of the chapters are longer, some are shorter. Uh, I read all of chapter 29 last week. I'm not going to read all of chapter 30 this week. But it's in a section where if you begin a chapter, I think it was chapter 20, 24. No, I'm sorry, chapter 27, you'll see this word, woe. Uh, woe to the leaders of Ephraim and Judah. Um, there, there's woes to Jerusalem, now there's woes to, more to Judah. Uh, it's, again, it, it's a word that expresses both sadness and alarm on God's part, trying to get, atten God's, trying to get it, the attention of his people. Um, we talked a lot about the sins of religious people. And, you know, it's interesting as the elders um, graciously prayed over myself and my wife, uh, Sue would be here today, but she's at work, uh, unfortunately. But she, um, you know, when we entered vocational ministry years ago, one of the, the hazards of vocational ministry, um, and I say it that way because all of you are in ministry. Uh, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you all have a ministry. You're in ministry somewhere. 
But it's kind of a strange animal when you're in vocational ministry. One of the hazards is that there's a, something that overtakes you as the years go by and you don't always recognize it. But you become a professional Christian in the sense where you, you don't do it consciously, but you, it's almost like you begin to believe that you've experienced to a greater degree the things that you're talking about than what you actually have. And it's because, hey, you know, you teach scripture, you read scripture, you share scripture with people, you pray with people, and, and it, there's a, a, a subtle thing that happens where because you're involved with the things of God so much, if you will, that maybe you know more than what you actually do. <laughs> and so um, the sabbatical comes at a good time. Uh, you, you all have been so generous over the years. This will be my third sabbatical. And I remember before, um, you know, um, the first two weeks were a lot of fun. You know, you're used to two-week vacations, right? But then after a couple weeks set in, it's like, okay, who am I apart from what I do? And um, who am I in, in relationship with you, Lord Jesus? And Isaiah here is addressing religious people, people who are, think that they've experienced more of God than what they actually have. The way the Lord put it is that these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. So, there's this thing that God is trying to get the attention of his people, and he does it through these woes. Chapter 30 is no different. If you follow along with me, I'm just going to read a few verses, make some comments, and we'll get into the text. But, woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. Have you ever been called obstinate? <laughs> uh, stubborn, perhaps, set in your ways? Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. And we'll get back to that in a moment. But really the key to this whole chapter is verse 18. Verse 18, and if you're following around uh, along in your outline, you'll see that the title is The God Who Waits. The God Who Waits. So, verse 18, and again, we'll come back to this in more detail, but this is after God's people rejected him again and again. This is after God's covenant people refused to repent, they refused to rest, they refused to trust in the Lord God. Instead, they wanted to trust in Egypt and the other nations and alliances, political alliances they could make. Things haven't changed so much, have they? And they kept refusing the Lord, but look at verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. It's a good thing I'm not the Lord. If people rejected me like that over and over again, verse 18 wouldn't read that way. It would read something like, yet the Lord is finally going to let you have it. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Now, that, that, that word translated in the NIV, yet the Lord longs, it's the same word that is used of Israel, of Judah, I should say. Blessed are all those who wait for him. In other words, yet the Lord waits. He's waiting to be gracious to you. Blessed are all those who wait for him. If you get anything out of this message this morning, I'd, encourage, I'd really be encouraged if it was this, that your waiting upon God is dependent upon his waiting upon you. His waiting for you, his longing to be patient and kind and compassionate to you makes your waiting possible. Maybe one of the ways we say it in the New Testament is that we in a similar way, we love because he first loved us. 
What makes it possible for us to love God and to love others? Well, he loved us first. What makes it possible for us to repent? What makes it possible for us to wait upon God? Well, his waiting upon us. The, law, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Um, I'll date myself a little bit here. It's in the 70s. There's a song. Some of you younger folks won't remember Tony Orlando. You remember Tony Orlando? He had this song called uh, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. Some of you might remember that. Uh, I promise I won't sing that for you. But the story in the song is of a man who has been in prison for three years, and he gets out of prison. He, he has written a letter to his, um, I'm guessing his wife or his girlfriend or someone that he is very close to, someone that he loved dearly and deeply. He wasn't sure that she would still want to be with him after being in prison for three years. And he said, look, just, um, well, I'll read you a few of the lyrics again. I'm not, not going to sing it. He says, I'm coming home. I've done my time. Now I've got to know what is and isn't mine. If you receive my letter telling you I'd soon be free, then you'll know just what to do if you still want me, if you still want me. And here's what he asked her to do. Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? If I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree, I'll stay on the bus, forget about us, and put the blame on me. And uh, then he asked the bus driver, he said, please look for me because I couldn't bear to see what I might see. He's afraid he wouldn't see a ribbon. And of course, then he'd stay on the bus and just keep going. He says, I'm really still in prison. I thought that was interesting. I'm really still in prison and my love, well, she holds the key. A simple yellow ribbon's what I need to set me free. And then he's, you know, the chorus goes on again and he asks her to tie the ribbon. And as they come up to the old oak tree and um, he says, uh, the whole bus is cheering and I can't believe what I see. And what did he see? Anyone? Yeah. He saw a hundred yellow ribbons. Um, she had been waiting for him, ready to welcome him back into her life, show her affection, her commitment to him. And if we can imagine that on just a simple little pop song level, how about God? Some of you may be here this morning saying, can I turn back to him? Would he still take me after all the things I've done, the things I've thought about, the things I've left undone? Um, if I dare drove up to that old rugged cross, that tree, would there be a ribbon there for me? Would he still welcome me back? Well, that's really our hope, that he will. You go back to verse 18 again, and that's my big idea this morning, is that the hope of religious people, really of all people, but chapter 30 is speaking to the religious folks who tend to put their hopes in perhaps other things besides God. But the hope of religious people is that God would wait for them, that he would wait for us, that when we pull up to see him, that he's still there. His waiting makes our waiting possible. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrased verse 18. He said, but God's not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. Really? It's not my picture of God. My picture of God is when I've stepped out of line, when I've been in prison or when I've done this and I've done that, he's just, boy, he's really just waiting to let me have it. And that, is not a, a positive connotation. <laughs> but God's not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. He's gathering strength to show mercy to you. God takes the time to do everything right, everything. Those who wait around for him are the lucky ones. Well, the NIV says, blessed are all who wait for him. Can I just say real quickly what your hope is not before we move on? Your, your hope and mine is not in being religious. It's not in being good. I mean, being religious or being good is not a bad thing. 
But if your hope is in being good, let me ask you, how good do you have to be in order for God to, to wait for you? <laughs> I mean, do you read it, reach a certain level and say, now nah, I'm good enough, and finally I, I, I feel like I can, I can actually look up to see if he's accepting of me? Your hope is not in how good or how religious or even how sincere you are. If I'm really sincere, then I'm sure God will be pleased with me. Really? Don't put your hope in your sincerity or in your goodness or in your religiosity. All that does, it, it, it minimizes and shrinks our so-called Christian life into something that, that others have called sin management. Or it's a focus upon yourself. Focus always upon how you're doing. Or, and I, I hope I'm doing better than yesterday. And, and I hope I do better tomorrow if I have tomorrow. And the focus again is just trying to manage all your sin. If your hope is on that, um, you're either thoroughly discouraged or th thoroughly proud. <laughs> because you think you're doing better than what you actually are. Patting yourself on the back. What is our hope? Our hope is in God himself. Our hope, Isaiah says earlier, God is my salvation. My salvation is not my sincerity. It's not my religiosity. It's not my vocational calling. My hope is in God himself. Enjoyment of God. Adoration of God. Worship of God. You see, one of the things you'll see in Isaiah over and over again is that the people, again, were very, very religious, very fastidious in, in their observations of religion and their sacrifices. But their hearts were far from God. So what is our hope? Our hope is that God would wait for us, that he is waiting for us still, let me share three things with you this morning. First of all, what happens when we do not hope or what happens when we don't wait for God? I'll try to move past that point rather quickly because it can get a little discouraging. Um, after that, uh, what is the hope of the religious people? And how can you tell when hope is beginning to bear fruit? That is, our waiting upon God as he waits for us. What does that begin to look like in our lives? First of all, what happens when we do not hope or wait for God? The first thing I would say is that there is no real security. There's no real security. Again, if you go to chapter 30, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. To those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge, but Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will, will bring you disgrace. And we could read more, but all I need to say at this point is that what Judah was doing is, was that, you know, Assyria was coming to, um, to conquer them, and after that, Babylon, and they said, well, maybe we can get help from Egypt. Maybe Egypt can be our security. And so they were jockeying the political game, if you will, thinking that Egypt would bring security. But God said, no, that, there's no security there. It's, it's interesting, verse 1. Do you see that word alliance? Forming an alliance, but not by my spirit. That word alliance occurs two other times in this section of Isaiah. If you go back to chapter 28, verse 20. The bed is too short to stretch out on, and the blanket is too narrow to wrap around you. Again, referring to a lack of true security for those who are relying upon someone other than God. And that word blanket is the same word for this word alliance. In other words, you're, you're trying to define this blanket, the security. Do you remember Linus and Peanuts, uh, the cartoon strip? Linus would always walk around, you know, sucking his thumb and then having a blanket. And sorry if there's some of you who are still walking around with a blanket, but that blanket's too short. It, it's not going to give you security. And that's what 
Isaiah is saying, this alliance, this blanket, and it's the same word if you look in chapter uh, 30, verse 22, it's the same word translated idol. Quite interesting. So same word for alliance, blanket, and idol. Then you will desecrate your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. Ray Ortland said it this way, is that Judah's alliance with Egypt covered them like a warm blanket. It made them feel comfortable against the storm of Assyria, but it was an idol, an idol. There's no real security when we don't wait and hope in God. But it's so easy to do. I mean, I can't see God. Uh, he, he hasn't sat down with me across from a table and had a cup of coffee with me. And so, you know, I can often see things and make alliances and find my security in things I can see, like, I don't know, my job, my bank account, my car, my friends. All of these are not bad things. They're good things, but in the end, it's not real security because those things will fade away. That's what happens when we do not hope and wait for God. And there's a sense of no security. Anxiety will creep in. Um, Isaiah constantly reminds us to have no fear. <laughs> Faith over fear. The second thing that happens is selective seeing and hearing when we do not wait for God. Jump over to verses 10 and 11. We looked a little bit at this last week. They, that is the rebellious people, deceitful children. Again, these are not the pagan nations, the unbelieving nations. These are God's religious people. Children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. And stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Paul's instruction to Timothy, very similar in the New Testament. Paul says this, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Just selective hearing. <laughs> selective seeing. Don't confront us with the Holy One of Israel. Now, I get it. I, I, I don't want to confront you with the Holy One of Israel every week. I Overall, I want to encourage you, and there's nothing wrong with that, but if it's only encouragement, and if it's only, you know, uh, tell us only pleasant things, prophesy illusions, if that's all you hear from the pulpit, uh, be careful. Be careful of being at a place that all they preach are illusions and pleasant things. Sometimes I need to hear that, yeah, we've discovered a spot on the lung. And I know that's not pleasant for you to hear, but here's the treatment going forward. Selective hearing and seeing. There was a commercial the other day. A man was yelling to his kids upstairs, Hey, kids, we got to leave in two minutes. No kids. <laughs> kids, we got to leave in a couple minutes. And the kids still didn't come down. Then he finally said, I'm going to McDonald's for breakfast. And the kids just Ran, you know, ran down the stairs. I don't know what you think of McDonald's, but the, in this commercial, they, they liked the... And so what happened? Did the kids hear the previous instructions? Yes. But their hearing was selective, if you will. And those of you who have young people know that sometimes that happens in families, right? Selective hearing, selective Seen. That's what happens when we, when we do not hope and wait for God. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take the pleasant stuff, but the things that are going to confront me, I'm not sure I want to hear that. One writer, Flannery O'Connor, she said this, the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. Isn't that good? 
The truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. So when we do not wait or hope for God, there's no real security, selective hearing, selective seeing. Last of all, before we move on, there's no courage, there's no presence. That is, it's like you become a ghost. There's no real substance in your life. Look at verse 15. Again, this is what happens when we don't wait and hope for God, the one who waits for us. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And this is the story of all of our lives, even after we come to Christ. Apart from His grace, this is us, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. In other words, Assyria or Babylon, they're not, they won't be able to catch us. We'll just get on horses and ride away. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses. Well, therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. You see, it's like when we set aside the word of God, it guarantees disaster where nothing remains but a flagpole to show that there were once people there. And you get the, the picture that the people have no more courage, no more sense of presence, and there's just a, a tattered flag flying in the wind, but there's no real substance to them anymore, to us anymore, when we no longer hope in the Lord. So what is our hope? What's the hope of religious people? First of all, a compassionate God. Again, verse 18 I don't think you can get enough of verse 18, by the way. I think we need to revisit that verse over and over and over again. Because there's something about us, especially the religious streak, if we do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that declares that we have been declared, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we've been declared righteous in his sight. But religious people, that's scary to hold on to, because we lose our leverage. We lose our, our leverage with holy God who will only accept the sacrifice of Jesus. And somehow we don't believe that God is compassionate. But look at, again at verse 18. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, that he's, he's waiting for you. He's giving you time to repent. He's giving you time to come to him. Therefore, he will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice, that he'll, he'll do what's right at the right time. Blessed are all those who wait for him. That's our hope, is a compassionate God. 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me just read you a few verses there. Because the context here is, is there were scoffers, and this was back during the, the early days of the church in the first century, and Peter is basically saying, you're all saying, where is this coming that was so promised? You've been talking about this for centuries. He isn't going to show up. And if that was happening 2,000 years ago, how about those of us now who, who, who talk about in that day, in that day when he comes back? There's, there's a level of skepticism in us if we're not careful. But look what Peter says. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Why? Why is he patient with us? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's compassionate. He gives us time. It's sad that not everyone will come to repentance. But that's our hope, is to wait upon a God who waits for us. By the way, just a, a little quick word of instruction and maybe a, an illustration by way of instruction. Anybody here ever in a hurry? No. Well, you know, one of the things I try to teach myself over time is like if I'm at Meyer or 
Aldi or someplace that has a long line. Aldi gets you through a little quicker. But I'll, I'll pick the long line just to slow down a little bit, reflect a little bit, maybe even pray a little bit. Imprecatory prayers for those in front of me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it tells me and reminds me I'm in no hurry. Someone else is in control. We have a God that waits for us. He says, I'm in no hurry. I'm going to take some time. Why? Because I want to give you time to repent. Compassionate God. And we also have a powerful God. Verses 27 through 33. Um, a lot of commentators have, have referred to this section as the apocalyptic, the apocalyptic portion of Isaiah. Now look at verse 27. I'm not going to read all, all of this, but see the name of the Lord comes from afar. With burning anger and dense clouds of smoke, his lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like a rushing torrent rising up to the neck. And, and, on, and we're going to come back to this in, in, in a moment, some, some more of these verses, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the hope of religious people is not just in a compassionate God, because if that's all he was, we could feel like, and, and this would be wrong, but we, that we could kind of push him around. But he is also the Lord God Almighty, powerful. He has all the power and all the might and all the sovereignty that we need to exercise his compassion. If he is only one or the other, if he is only almighty, I would be scared to death to repent and to come to him because then he might let me have it. <laughs> but if he was only compassionate, I probably wouldn't have a whole lot of respect for him. I don't know. I'd think I could get away with stuff. There's a psalm, I forgot to write it down, but it says that with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. That's powerful. We need a compassionate God, a powerful God. That's, that's our hope. Well, how can you tell that hope is bearing fruit? And that's what I want to close with. You could tell that you're beginning to hope in this God that's waiting for you to turn to him when you are experiencing repentance and rest. Look at verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. What's your salvation going to be? Is it going to be Egypt? Is it going to be the right person and not the wrong person gets into the White House? What's your hope going to be? Well, your repentance and rest, your quietness and trust, that's where your salvation will come from. And that's because you're placing it in the Lord God Almighty. That's when your hope is beginning to bear fruit. Jesus himself, of course, said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You find rest in him. By the way, the context there, Jesus is talking about the Sabbath and how it's kept and all the religious people were so burdened about keeping the Sabbath. And he said, you want a real Sabbath? You want a real rest? You have to come to me. And you begin to experience the rest. But again, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it says you would have none of it. So when I went home to Illinois to visit my mom to see how she was doing, most of you know that my mom was a nurse her whole life, and she was a, a, a charge nurse. She was in charge of the pediatric ward, very capable, very competent uh, manager for years and years and years. Um, all that to say is that she makes a terrible patient. <laughs> <laughs> Most people of any kind of a medical background don't make the best patients in the world. And so when I first saw her, she said, I don't know what I'm here for. And uh, they're not doing anything for me. And so I, we were telling mom, mom, well, this is what they're doing. This is how they're taking care of. And she said, well, I think I'm just going to check out on AMA against medical advice. She didn't. 
we, we talked her out of it, but we just tried to remind her that everything they're doing here for you is for your recovery. But she is very close. She would have none of it. <laughs> That's us. That's us to a degree. The Lord says, will you trust me? I'm waiting for you in compassion. Uh, I long to be compassionate for you and toward you. I'm not going to force myself upon you. I'm going to give you time to repent and to return. But we say, against medical advice, so I'm going to do it on my own. I'll find security elsewhere. But you know, hope is bearing fruit when we actually begin to rest. Anybody here in need of rest? Anybody here in need of faith over fear? <laughs> it's all of us. I could spend more time on that, but let me just mention this. You know that hope is beginning to bear fruit when teaching gets traction. That is, you start to actually find interest in the Word of God. And, and, and we no longer find ourselves either on a Sunday service, you know, saying, okay, when's this over? Yeah, I've heard this before. Whatever. Or we actually open up Scripture on our own and begin to read it. And we find delight in it. Look at verse 20. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. So there's this idea that, that the teachers start to emerge. And don't equate teachers just with someone who has a formal role like standing behind a pulpit. You'll, you'll learn from just about anything and anyone when you begin to have your hope in the Lord. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. So you go this way, you go that way, and wherever you go, you hear this, this teacher. This is the way, walk in it. And where does that come from? Because you are placing your hope now in God and you're starting to experience repentance and rest and you're no longer avoiding this Holy One of Israel and saying, don't confront me any longer with him. No, instead you're saying, I need confrontation. Healthy, hopeful confrontation. I'm not going to reject that. Teaching gets traction there's no longer a famine of the word of God, as Amos would say, nor is there going to be the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, as we saw. But everywhere we turn, we hear the word of God and we see its powerful effects. That's when you know that hope is beginning to bear fruit. Finally, what is God's promise for those who hope in him, who are waiting for him? Let me just read you a couple scriptures real quickly and then... Um, We'll close with a worship song. But this, Isaiah chapter 40. The context here again is Judah saying, you know, God has forgotten about us. Where is he? He's disregarded my cause. Isaiah chapter 40. Then the Lord says, why do you complain? Why do you say my way is hidden? My cause is disregarded. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Anybody here experience weariness this week? Everybody can raise their hands. That's okay. <laughs> Sense of weakness sense of where are you God well if you wait for him it says listen to what happens even yous grow tired and weary young men even you will grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord they might renew their strength they may perhaps soar on wings like eagles it might be possible that they'll run and not grow weary you know the word I like in there will <laughs> Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let me just say this real quickly. So in verse 31, it's quite interesting. You have this, you start off with soaring on wings like eagles. 
that's okay. That appeals to me somewhat. But I don't know if I have the energy to soar on wings like eagles. I'm not even sure I need to do that all the time. That's just, that's an occasional thing, right? Soaring on wings like eagles. And even run and not be weary. I need to run from time to time, and that's helpful, and that's a wonderful promise. But you know what I need every day? The promise that I'll be able to walk and not be faint. Because I walk every day. I don't fly all the time. I don't run much anymore. But I walk. And that promise to you is that he will be with you and walk with you as you wait for this one who waits for you. That's your hope. You know, one of the things I was a little scared of when I went home, because I haven't seen my mom for over a year and a half, and she, uh, she's struggling with dementia. And some of my brothers warned me, she, she usually remembers everything and everybody, and she did. I mean, that, that would have been a huge loss if she couldn't remember me, right? <laughs> but I was a little, little concerned she wouldn't remember me. But she did. Um, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? But then listen to this. And here's the Lord, the waiting one, trying to encourage those who who keep turning away from him, keep saying, but, but no, I'm going to do it on my own. And this is what he says. Though this mother, she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Back to Tony Orlando. He said, dare I look to that tree to see if there's a ribbon there? Has she forgotten me? But can we look to the tree, the cross of Christ, and say, have you forgotten me? And he says, no. Though your mother may forget you, I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That he is our hope. Not our religion, not our goodness, not our sincerity, but the one on the tree who waits for us. Don't make him wait much longer. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Good, meaningful word. Well, we have time for one more song. Please stand and join us if you're able. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. That's us, right?
One of my favorite scriptures is, is Luke 15, and you might remember uh, there were some real religious folks complaining to Jesus that he is hanging out with the wrong people. And so I love it. So, so Jesus told them this story. <laughs> he told them the story about the lost son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep. And one of the things that are consistent about each of those lost things is that when they were found, there was rejoicing. If you want to be a cause of rejoicing in heaven, uh, turn to him. Don't wait till you get better. You'll be waiting a long, long time. He just, he, he wants you as you are. Just come to him. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. How are you doing today? Good to see you. Good to see you. Are you still in school? So, no. No? I, I, yeah, I, um, I'm looking to go back to get my master's soon.